Okay, so before spring break, we were talking about the period after the uh, American, or after the War of 1812, excuse me. And we're looking at several large themes. Uh, the first of these themes, of course, is territorial expansion. And in order to understand what's happening here, you've got to go back to the Louisiana Purchase. Once New Spain and the United States become neighbors, Americans begin launching filibustering expeditions into what is now Texas, uh, many of them claiming that Texas was a part of the Louisiana Purchase, although, of course, the Spanish denied that it ever was. There had been a number of these filibustering expeditions, and in this context, a filibuster is an unauthorized military expedition by a foreign country, or, or sorry, by uh, private individuals of a foreign country. So there had been a number of filibustering expeditions into what is now Texas, um, so the Spanish had gotten greatly concerned about Texas. And then at the end of the uh, War of 1812, the United States sent General Andrew Jackson, the hero of the war, uh, down to Florida, uh, the Seminole tribe in Florida, who had been launching uh, raids into Georgia and, of course, accepting runaway slaves from Georgia into their midst. They were causing trouble, and so the U.S. government sent Jackson, and Jackson actually marched U.S. troops into Florida, Spanish Florida, causing an international incident. And just as an aside, the Seminoles are the only Native American tribe that never signed a treaty with the U.S. government, uh, and as you can see, it got them the exact same places it got everyone else, and that is removed to what is now Oklahoma. So, didn't get them very far at all. And the U.S. actually fought three different wars with the Seminoles. Uh, the first, this is the first Seminole War, but there would be a second and third Seminole War, uh, the third one concluding in 1858. So, to keep that in mind. When Andrew Jackson marches into Spanish Florida, finally the Spanish have had enough. Uh, Louis Onis, Louis Onis, excuse me, uh, the Spanish foreign minister sits down with John Quincy Adams, uh, the United States Secretary of State at the time, and they hammer out what became known as the Adams Onis Treaty. And the Adams Onis Treaty is what you can see there on your map. They drew that red line uh, separating the United States from New Spain. Um, and so the United States gives up all claims on Texas that might arise out of the Louisiana Purchase for good. Uh, and in exchange for $2 million, the United States acquires Florida and big parts of the Gulf Coast. Uh, you can see there the uh, striped area, uh, the U.S. acquires Florida. So we give up Florida for Texas, not a great bargain if you ask your average Texan. But nevertheless, this is the adams Onis Treaty Line. And you can see for the first time, these are the outlines of the eastern boundary of what would become Texas later on. So meanwhile, of course, James Monroe is elected. Meanwhile, of course, James Monroe was elected president in 1816 over Rufus King, the Federalist candidate, but because of the Hartford Convention and other issues like that, you can see that Monroe soundly beat King in the Electoral College in 1816. Monroe is what's left of the National Republicans. And Monroe's election touches off what is known as the era of good feelings. We're going to come back to that in a moment, but let's continue looking at our big themes. The first theme, of course, is territorial expansion by the United States, which starts with the drawing of the adams onis Treaty. A corollary to U.S. territorial expansion, of course, was the displacement of Native American tribes. Uh, there was increasing pressure put on the five civilized tribes. They were called civilized, quote-unquote, because they had adopted Western methods of dress, farming, even slaveholding. And these tribes were the Cherokees, the Creeks, the Seminoles, the Choctaws, and the Chickasaws. And between 1815 and finally when President Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, 
uh, you had these tribes that continuously came under increasing pressure, especially by land speculators, uh, as they were pushed out of their uh, homelands and forcibly relocated to Indian Territory, uh, what is now Oklahoma, but it was called then Indian Territory. So keep that in mind. That is the second of our large themes during this time period is Indian displacement. The third of our large themes during this time is called the Transportation Revolution. During the latter part of the 18th century and the early part of the 19th century, transportation underwent some serious steps forward in terms of reliability, in terms of speed. And you had several elements of this transportation revolution. You had roads. Prior to this, all roads in the United States were really well-worn cow paths. Uh, but you ha started having roads that were designed by professional engineers, raised up from the ground around them, had irrigation ditches dug on either side of them. So really impressive achievements, these roads. Uh, the best known example, of course, is the National Road, which was built from Cumberland, Maryland to Wheeling in what is now West Virginia, what was then Virginia, between 1811 and 1815. Meanwhile, a second aspect of the transportation revolution involved the development of steamboats. Now, the steam engine had actually been invented in Paris in the 1790s, but it was an American, Robert Fulton, who first put a steam engine into a boat, the Claremont, in 1807, and demonstrated its, the strength of a steamboat by sailing it upriver, up the Hudson River from New York to Albany. And of course, that's important because he's going against the current of the river. And now, regardless of where you are, you don't have to worry about your sails not having wind in them. You don't have to worry about anything except the steam engine breaking down. And it greatly speeds up the reliability as well as the speed of transportation. A third development, of course, was the wide use during this time period of canals or man-made waterways. Uh, these canals linked larger bodies of water. The most famous example, of course, is the Erie Canal, which was completed in 1825 across New York State, ran for 300 miles from uh, Buffalo on Lake Erie east to uh, Albany on the Hudson River. And with the completion of the Erie Canal, then you linked the Great Lakes region with the, uh, with the eastern seaboard. Excuse me. Uh, of course, there were other canals, like the one that linked uh, the Lake Michigan with the Mississippi uh, at Chicago. Uh, and of course, that linked the Great Lakes region with uh, the Mississippi River. And so now, if you are a farmer, especially in the Midwest, you have a multiple, a multiplicity of ways to get your crops to market. Uh, you can put them aboard a steamboat anywhere in the Great Lakes region, sail them through the Erie Canal. Uh, you can sail them uh, over through Lake Michigan over to the Mississippi. So really pretty impressive achievements. And finally, one other thing I actually left off this slide, but should be noted, is that this is also the era of railroads. Uh, the first railroads are being built across the United States beginning in the 1820s. And railroads also aid, add to the speed and reliability of transportation. And we're going to see what this transportation revolution does and how important it is for the economic growth of the country here in the next slide. The transportation revolution gives way to, makes possible our final large theme for this time period, and that is the market revolution. I cannot overstate the importance of the market revolution to the development of the United States. Uh, you had a movement away from diversified farming so that farmers began to farm single cash crops that were meant for market, for the world market economy. And in particular, the market revolution revolved around the production of cotton. Uh, of course, at the time of the American Revolution, cotton was not terribly profitable, but with the patenting of uh, the improvement to the cotton engine or cotton gin 
by Eli Whitney in 1793, all of a sudden cotton was extraordinarily profitable. The average enslaved person could gin, that is, remove the seeds from the lint of one pound of cotton lint per day prior to the cotton gin. After the cotton gin, and many cotton gins, of course, were powered by steam, horsepower, and then later steam engines, the average enslaved person could gin 50 pounds of cotton per day, so it actually increased productivity 50-fold. Uh, with this, cotton became extraordinarily profitable and began to spread across the southeastern United States, uh, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and finally, ultimately, of course, Texas. We'll talk about that. Florida as well, and South Carolina. But with the expansion of cotton came the expansion of slavery, because as cotton is more profitable, slavery is more profitable. And so this is really when you start to see slavery take off. And the economic foundations of the United States are built in this market revolution. The economic foundations of the United States are built on slavery. Uh, the, the, and this is also the foundation of American capitalism. American capitalism is built on slavery and the profits that came out of slavery. So keep that in mind. You also have innovations in commerce and banking at this time. Um, innovations in commerce like the emergence of the cotton factor. Uh, cotton factors were wealthy individuals who generally lived in port cities and they would extend credit to cotton growers, to enslavers to grow cotton to keep their operation going throughout the year. And then of course they would take a commission off the top once they'd so the, the cotton factors would sell the cotton crop at market at the most advantageous times. They would take a commission off the top for themselves and then take back whatever money they had loaned to the uh, to the enslaver. And then of course the rest of the money that was left over went back to the enslaver and enslavers invested this money in more land and more cotton and more enslaved African Americans. In terms of banking, uh, of course, you had the Bank of the United States that is funding a lot of this expansion of cotton. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, the, the banking system of the United States is funding a lot of this. And you also had some nascent industrialism, uh, some underdeveloped industrialism you had the founding of the Boston Manufacturing Company uh, at, uh, oh, where was it? Uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, I believe, in 1813. And so now you're starting to have, um, you're starting to have uh, textile mills uh, in New England to refine all of these slave-made goods. So that is how the U.S. becomes a world economic powerhouse in the period between the end of the War of 1812 in 1815 and the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861. So over that time period, the United States becomes a world economic powerhouse on slavery and cotton. You can see here uh, maps talking about the uh, transportation and market revolution. The map on the right hand side is a map of uh, showing the directions and the volume of trade uh, along with canals and roads. The canals are marked with small black lines. The canals or the roads, excuse me, are marked with small red lines. And so the larger the arrow, the larger the volume of trade. On the left-hand side, you can see where certain crops are being grown. You can see uh, wheat, corn, cattle being grown in the north and the Midwest. And that striped area that goes from Georgia down through Alabama and Mississippi and the Mississippi Valley, that is the cotton kingdom. Meanwhile, of course, you have sugar cane that's also being grown by enslaved African Americans in South Louisiana. So that should give you a good idea of what's happening there. Okay, so we call the period directly following the War of 1812 the Era of Good Feelings because it's this brief interlude between the end of the war and the beginning of the age of Jackson. 
And we call it the era of good feelings because you essentially only have one political party that is uh, has any sort of influence or power. Uh, they call themselves the National Republicans. Uh, they're led by uh, men like uh, President Monroe, by Henry Clay. And so we call it the era of good feelings, not because there's no conflict, but because you have this uh, this one political party, the Federalist Party, has died out because of the Hartford Convention uh, and uh, and other uh, aspects as well. And the National Republicans are what's left. So, during this era of good feelings, you have a number of important developments. You have Henry Clay, uh, and Clay, of course, from Kentucky, as we talked about. Clay has a program called his American System, which is a proposed series of spending, uh, well, first of all, tariffs, and then tariffs to raise money for spending on internal improvements uh, like roads, uh, like railroads, uh, like canals. And so this American system, uh, which does find some success in the Congress and also creates a lot of controversy, kind of overshadows this era of good feelings. Now, in 1811, Congress had failed to recharter the First Bank of the United States. Uh, there were a variety of reasons for that, but they felt the bank was no longer necessary. They soon saw that that was not the case uh, as the economy began to tank during the War of 1812, and there were no economic controls. And so, in 1816, you have two very important uh, developments. First of all, the Congress passes the first tariff in the history of the Congress, a 25% protective tariff, uh, the Tariff of 1816. Now, keep in mind, a tariff is a tax on imported goods that is meant to protect domestic American manufacturing. So Henry Clay uh, wants this tariff. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the Congress in the same session also recharters the Bank of the United States, the second bank of the United States, uh, on a 20-year charter, just like the first bank. And so that second bank of the United States is uh, also going to become a political football during the age of Jackson, so keep an eye on that. Now, there was controversy over these internal improvements because the bulk of the burden for these internal improvements fell on the agricultural areas of the south and west they're paying the higher prices for imported goods or higher prices for domestically manufactured goods whereas the northeast new england and areas like that which is rapidly industrializing are seeing the benefits of these uh, the tariff money which is going to create these internal improvements so there's a lot of controversy over them in the midst of all this comes the panic of 1819 uh, the Panic of 1819 is the first serious economic downturn that the U.S. Uh, saw after the period directly following the Revolution. And what causes the Panic of 1819 largely is a land bubble. All of that land that's coming open in the South, uh, well, they called it the Southwest. We would now call it the Southeast, uh, what is now Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, all that new land for cotton and slavery. Uh, there is more demand than there is supply for that land. And so, as you know from basic economics, when demand outstrips supply, you see prices artificially rise beyond the actual value of something. So in this case, the Bank of the United States had been lending money to people to purchase land at these inflated prices. And so that bubble popped in 1819 when the Bank of the United States started calling in some of those loans and people were unable to repay the loans because uh, they had purchased the land at inflated prices. Uh, the Panic of 1819 is going to set a lot of things into motion. Uh, it's going to set the settlement of Texas by Americans into motion. We'll see that later. It also gives people a lot of pause about supporting banks, men like Andrew Jackson, who lost everything or lost a lot of money in the Panic of 1819. So, and they blamed it rightfully on the Bank of the United States. So we'll see how that plays out. But the Panic of 1819 does cast a shadow of economic malaise over the country for the next decade. It takes a decade to recover. 
from the Panic of 1819. Meanwhile, James Monroe is re-elected in 1820 without opposition. This is why it's called the Era of Good Feelings. Normally, if the economy tanks while a president is in office, uh, the president gets voted out the next time around, but Monroe, Monroe wins because there is virtually no opposition to him. So uh, we're going to see even more conflict in the Era of Good Feelings as we go forward. You can see here the Electoral College of 1820 with uh, James Monroe, and there is only one electoral vote cast against James Monroe. One elector voted for Secretary of State John Quincy Adams simply to ensure that Monroe did not carry the Electoral College unanimously because that was an honor that was reserved for George Washington and George Washington alone. But this is actually, the, in terms of the Electoral College, the biggest landslide the country has ever had apart from George Washington's two terms in office. And you see that asterisk next to the state of Missouri. Uh, Missouri is a new state. It was not fully admitted. And that asterisk is a good uh, segue for leading us into the next portion of this lecture, which deals with the Missouri Compromise. In 1817, Missouri, the Missouri Territory applied for statehood to the United States. And Missouri applied for statehood as a slave state. And that's a serious problem for a variety of reasons. First of all, uh, Missouri is the first state outside of Louisiana itself that was a part of the Louisiana Purchase to apply for statehood. And it applied as a slave state. And if you take a look at the map, you can see how far north Missouri is. Uh, Missouri lies just across the Mississippi from Illinois. As you probably know, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 banned slavery north of the Ohio River. And so now the question is, is Missouri and all areas of the Louisiana Purchase, are they going to become slave states like Missouri? And so the Congress does not admit Missouri. A huge battle about slavery breaks out. This is the first time that slavery had really been publicly debated in the Congress since the Constitutional Convention of 1787. In 1819, Representative Henry Talmadge offered an amendment that would, uh, uh, that would uh, gradually phase out slavery in Missouri. Uh, the Talmadge Amendment was defeated, and so now the hard lines in Congress have been drawn on slavery. Finally, the Congress decided on the 3630 parallel as a line of demarcation. Uh, they decided to compromise, led by Henry Clay, who becomes known as the Great Compromiser because of this. They decided on the 3630 parallel. That is that other than Missouri, no states coming in north of the 3630 parallel will become slave states, and no states south of the 3630 parallel will come in as free states. Uh, now, the compromise was not quite complete because there, there had been a a delicate balance in the U.S. Senate between slave states and free states. Uh, you had uh, an equal number of slave states and free states represented in the U.S. Senate, maintaining a balance of power, and the admission of Missouri was going to upset that balance of power in favor of the slave states. So in 1819, though, Maine applied for statehood separate from Massachusetts. And so when Maine applied for statehood, the Congress agreed to admit Maine and Missouri uh, more or less in, at the same time, maintaining that balance of power. And what was known as the Missouri Compromise passed the Congress. Now, the members of the founding generation who were rapidly dying out by 1820 watched what happened with the Missouri Compromise with increasing horror Thomas Jefferson wrote to a friend that the Missouri Compromise was like a fire bell in the night. That is a warning. The house is on fire. Get out. Jefferson said that he was now convinced that slavery was the rock upon which the ship of Union would wreck. And so Thomas Jefferson understood, like many of the, of the founding generation, that if slavery ever became an issue for national debate, that it would eventually split the country and destroy the original United States, which in some ways I suppose it did because the Missouri Compromise touches off uh, a series of fights over slavery that 
play out over the next 40 years until the outbreak of the American Civil War. So the Missouri Compromise is a very important milestone on our road to civil war. Uh, keep that in mind. You can see here a map of what the Missouri Compromise does. Missouri was officially admitted as a slave state in 1821, Maine as a free state in 1820, but you see all of that unorganized territory uh, that is going to come in as free states. You see the 3630 Missouri Compromise line. But here's the question. What happens if the country expands again to the west and the southwest? What happens if what is what was then New Spain and then Mexico as of 1821 what if that becomes part of the United States? Does, does that Missouri Compromise line, does it follow all the way to the Pacific? That was an open question. For slaveholding states, they assumed that if the country expanded, the Missouri Compromise would be revisited, renegotiated. For the free states in the north, they assumed that that Missouri Compromise line would be stretched all the way to the Pacific. And of course, it was these misunderstandings that when the country did expand again, beginning with the annexation of Texas in 1845 and the culmination of the U.S.-Mexican War in 1848, that the debate over where slavery would exist became unsolvable, intractable, and led directly to the outbreak of civil war in 1861. Meanwhile, John Marshall, who is still Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, you know, keep in mind Marshall became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in 1801 and remained until his death in 1835. Marshall and the court are making a series of very important decisions during this time period that help give shape to the Constitution. Uh, one of the first really important decisions during this time is the case of Dartmouth College v. Woodward. Uh, Dartmouth, which is in New Hampshire, had been founded as a private college originally, and the president of Dartmouth attempted to turn Dartmouth into a public college, uh, the State College of New Hampshire, if you will. And the trustees of Dartmouth sued the president of Dartmouth and Mr. Woodward. The case came before the Supreme Court in 1819 as the case of Dartmouth College v. Woodward. And here, Marshall reinforced the contract clause of the Constitution in that states cannot, uh, cannot abrogate, states cannot deny uh, or alter contracts made between private parties. Uh, the court viewed the founding documents of Dartmouth as a contract and therefore that Mr. Woodward could not alter that contract. So once again, here you have Marshall asserting the contract clause to create a friendlier business environment in the United States, in this case, keeping Dartmouth College a private college. Meanwhile, you also have the case of McCulloch v. Maryland, which is even more important during this time period. When the Congress established the Second Bank of the United States in 1816, they also established branches in several cities, and one of the branches was in Baltimore, Maryland. Well, the state of Maryland passed a tax on the bank, the branch of the Bank of the United States that is in Baltimore, that was in Baltimore, and the president of that branch of the bank, Mr. McCulloch, refused to pay the tax, and he sued Maryland. And it came to the Supreme Court as the case of McCulloch v. Maryland in 1819. Here, Marshall and the court referred to the supremacy clause of the Constitution in which the federal constitution always takes precedent over state laws. Marshall wrote in this decision that the power to tax is the power to destroy. And so because the constitution looks to an indestructible union that a state cannot tax a branch of the federal government, of course, that has become constitutional doctrine ever since. Uh, whenever federal law comes into conflict with state law, Federal law trumps state law every time. A third major case heard and decided by the court during this time period was the case of Gibbons v. Ogden in 1824. 
And this involved two companies that operated ferries in between New York and New Jersey. And New York had given an exclusive license for one ferry company to operate between the two states. So a smaller ferry company came along and sued New York to get in on this commerce. The case came before the Supreme Court as Gibbons v. Ogden in 1824. And in this case, the Supreme Court ruled against the state of New York and against the larger ferry company because of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. The Commerce Clause says that only Congress can regulate commerce in between two different states. And therefore, because the ferry was operating between New York and New Jersey, the state of New York could not give an exclusive right to operate to one company. And by enforcing the Commerce Clause, Marshall goes further in encouraging a good business environment for the United States, uh, because that means that states cannot give exclusive licenses for businesses to operate. Only Congress can regulate interstate commerce. And these decisions underscore the brilliance of John Marshall. Uh, he is perhaps the finest Chief Justice the United States has ever had. And these decisions have gone down as the basic framework of constitutional interpretation to this very day. Meanwhile, in terms of foreign affairs, there were a number of republics in Latin America at this time that were breaking away from Spain, from the mother country of Spain. You have Mexico that becomes independent in 1821, Venezuela in 1823, and there's a lot of support for these Latin American republics in the United States. After all, the United States had been a series of colonies that belonged to, to Great Britain, that broke away from Great Britain. And so uh, Americans feel solidarity with these Latin American republics. But there are threats from the Grand Alliance, the same Grand Alliance in Europe that had defeated Napoleon. There are threats that they want to retake these colonies uh, for Spain. And so President James Monroe reacted to the threats from the Grand Alliance. In his annual message to Congress on December 2nd, 1823, Monroe elucidated what became known as the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe warned European countries to stay out of the affairs of the United States, uh, of the Western Hemisphere, excuse me, uh, or risk U.S. military intervention. In other words, stay out of our backyard or you're going to risk U.S. military intervention. And the Monroe Doctrine, as it became known, uh, became a bedrock principle of U.S. foreign policy over the next uh, decades, even into the 20, well into the 20th century. In fact, President John F. Kennedy invoked the Monroe Doctrine when blockading or quarantining Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Now, of course, you know, since the Cold War, uh, the Monroe Doctrine would be almost impossible to enforce but nevertheless, for a very long time, the Monroe Doctrine did serve as a bedrock foreign principle of U.S. foreign policy, first elucidated by President James Monroe in 1823. The presidential election of 1824 turned out to be one of the most contentious and fractured presidential elections in the history of the United States. Uh, in the end, uh, although the election was thrown into the U.S. House of Representatives, John Quincy Adams, Secretary of State and son of former President John Adams, won the presidency. But uh, the presidential election of 1824 ended the era of good feelings. Uh, and it gave rise to Andrew Jackson. So we're going to see transition into what historians call the age of Jackson when we talk more about the presidential election of 1824 in the next lecture.